From Chicago's Can TV, a look at the week's events is reported in the newspapers, in the blogs and online, and on radio and TV. This is Chicago Newsroom. And hello again. Welcome to another edition of Chicago Newsroom here on Can TV. I'm Ken Davis, and once again, it's a it's a warm summer August day, and we're confronted with nothing but good news. We just heard the news on the way in this morning that gasoline is going to go down to uh, two dollars a gallon. All we have to do is elect Michelle Bachman. She's going to do it. She hasn't explained how. It would probably the critics are saying all they're just saying all this nasty stuff like oh it would take a worldwide depression to bring that about and we'd have to drill in everybody's backyard and all that but hey you know two dollars can't beat that can you and there's all sorts of other news that we're going to be talking about today with michael miner and andy shaw who are joining us on the newsroom panel today glad to have you guys both here mm -hmm. michael miner of course is with the uh, chicago reader been doing well hot type but i guess I we don't, don't think they call, call it anymore it's just it's just michael miner now guess so. well anyway I've he been does branded. He does Michael Miner in the Reader uh, every week and, and has been talking about and uh, uh, discussing media issues for a very long time. And we're going to use some of his expertise here today. Another guy who knows something about media is Andy Shaw. Andy's been on the show before. Happy uh, returns to you, Andy. Uh, Andy worked at Channel 7 for, I think, uh, about 40, 50 years or something before. 26, <laughs> but you're close. Before, before uh, as Michael said, uh, astonishingly rebuilding the Better Government Association. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's something to see. And we're really happy to have you here today. We can start with you, Andy, because yesterday you did a town hall, a televised town hall, uh, a one-on-one -on -one interview for about 45 minutes with His Honor the Mayor. And I got to tell you, I watched the whole thing, and I actually watched it again this morning. And it's just, it is a sea change that, a, that a, a veteran television person can sit down for 45 minutes with the mayor of Chicago and have a kind of an honest, um, what would you say, sort of um, free-flowing Collegial? Exchange. I guess you can't claim that with Rom, can you? Well, as collegial as Rom is going to get. He's going to be combative right, no, matter how, right. no matter how courteous you choose to That's be. And I chose shtick. to be extraordinarily courteous <laughs> yesterday. He was still fairly combative. He just wasn't as combative as he might have been if I'd been more like my old yeah, Andy Shaw. Yeah, but I chose yeah. to be a little more courteous because running an anti-corruption watchdog organization is very different from being the political reporter at a television station. And I thought 100 days into this new regime, uh, the mayor deserved an opportunity to explain what he's doing, what he's not doing, how it compares with the past. And it really wasn't TV in the traditional sense. We called it a live stream. This mm -hmm. is part of the wave of the future. Michael writes about it frequently. But this was on our website, bettergov.org, where it will live ad infinitum shortly when it's posted. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was an interesting experience. As you point out, when you do something on the web versus television, you sort of start cold. You don't know when you're live <laughs> or hot, unlike this show, which still has regular cues. <laughs> right. But I did, Old -fashioned and TV, I got yeah. a lot of interesting feedback. A lot of people thought that I had sold out and wasn't the old Andy Shaw because mm -hmm. I didn't grill him or press him hard enough. Others thought that it was extraordinarily informative. I just thought it was a good opportunity to deal with good government issues, honesty, transparency, mm -hmm. fairness, efficiency, and accountability. And I thought that he did a pretty good job of, of explaining where he's at on those things in the first hundred days. So I thought it was worthwhile. Well, I did too. And I got to say that, that um, as as gentlemen who are a little older i suppose we kind of have this we place this value on spending a little extra time and not cramming everything into 18 seconds when when you see Rahm Emanuel kind of unpacked uh, and 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 in a more relaxed uh, form you really begin to understand that whether or not you're a Rom fan, he has a grasp of these issues. And he you put really that perfectly. Let me, let me say this very clearly because I even told him this because it's not, a, it's not illegal to give someone a compliment. He isn't, he isn't particularly likable, and you may <laughs> disagree with a lot of the things he's doing. Yeah. But I think if you look at his track record, everything he starts out to do, he gets done. He did that for Bill Clinton, for Barack Obama. Yeah. He did it in helping the Democrats reclaim co Congress in 06. He did that in helping Mayor Daley raise extraordinary amounts of money. Mm -hmm. He did that in his mayoral race. I think that here is a man who, for better or worse, is perfectly suited to this job. He is smart. 
He is focused, he multitasks, he delegates, and he's tough as nails. And you put all those things together, it's what you need to run a big city in crisis, and that's Chicago right now. So whether you like, you may disagree with the policies and the procedures, but I'll tell you one thing, what he starts out to do, he's gonna get done, and I think that's extraordinary because you can't say that about so, of that many politicians. <laughs> you, I, you, were, you were twittering. No, no I, I think that's twitching. But you say he's not likable. I, I wonder what we mean by that. Does that mean he's not? He's not he, warm and fuzzy. He's not politically likable by the likes of us, or does yeah, he? Yeah. He, he doesn't have friends. I, yeah, well, well, he must I mean, have friends. I know he does. He's got lots of them. Yeah. You know what? That's yeah. a good point. I don't mean. Look, I, I sort of like him, but but he doesn't waste a lot of time with small talk. Uh -huh. He's not a comfortable person to just talk uh, quietly with. Mm -hmm. He's so intense. He's so focused and he's so serious that he's not the sort of person that you would imagine having a couple beers with in a bar <laughs> comfortably. Now, I could be dead wrong, you could and he be. may be, you could be, but I just think that there's an intensity level and a, and a driven level that, that is a little bit off-putting for people. And, you know, he was pretty combative during that 45 minutes, mm -hmm. and I was not particularly tough. Right, he, right. he doesn't like to be challenged or second-guessed or undermined or questioned mm -hmm. too rigidly, and I think that's, that's where I get the sense of not being particularly Well, I, I, uh, I, I'm more than willing to donate this, uh, the intellectual property, to Second City if you guys want to take this. But uh, it, it occurred to me that uh, watching your show that I just, I just kind of got this vision of somebody some aide popping the head in the, in the door and saying, hey boss, I'm running over to Panera, you want any lunch? And he says, three things. First, <laughs> and I was thinking it's a good thing he's missing part of one finger. <laughs> because he can only get three and a half. <laughs> Thankfully, he only can get like three things on one hand. If he right. had, I was thinking if he had chopped off two fingers, right. he could answer the questions yeah, more quickly, more, more but quickly, yeah. that might have been painful. And third, I want the soup. Yeah. And fourth, why there? Why don't you go to, you know, so, but yeah, it just, it, it, I don't think he ever answers a question without saying three things. And, and you've seen this and everybody else has. And we got to move off of this. But, but one of the things that is just hilarious to me is that he will not let you go until he has ended point number three. Well, you could get into a real shouting match <laughs> with him and he'd probably uh, <laughs> succumb at points. But that's correct. If you let him, yeah. if you let him. Unless, unless you choose to be really, really aggressive yeah, and combative, yeah. he's going to well, finish. Well, okay, all right, enough of this yeah. Rom stuff. Oh, my God. We, we, this happens to us every week. We end up sitting here talking about either Rom or Richard M. Daly for the first 10 minutes, and it's, you know, I mean, it's... Mike Miner, in last week's edition of The Reader, uh -huh. uh, your column, Mike Miner, uh, you guys, you talked about Andy and you talked about something called feeding the digital beast. Right. And what happened was I just immediately called you guys up and said, I want to have you on the show because I want to talk about this. I don't even know where to begin with this. And Mike, you can, you can sort of frame this for us. But we all know the media is changing. Newspapering is changing. Radio, TV, everything is changing. But one of the things that's not changing is that the beast is always hungry. It's just that the online beast is even hungrier. The since the uh, the reader added a website and we were expected to contribute to it, I felt that I was back at the beginning of my career as a journalist, <laughs> which which started working for UPI in St. Uh -huh. Louis. It was a little bureau, and I did absolutely everything for them. I mean, I operated the linotype machine. I did you really? I wrote stories at the machine. You, know? so you can even write while you're composing it, right? Yeah. You know, and as it's going out, I had to stay about five seconds ahead of the machine. Um, <laughs> And then I sort of grew up. <laughs> I went to the Sun Times and I felt that I grew up. I had a little time to think about the stories before yeah. I wrote them. Yeah. And then when I went to the reader, I had a week to think about stories. And now I'm back at that line of time mission. <laughs> because if, if you have a website and, and all journals, journalists, all media feel they have to, even if they're not sure what to do with it, um, they have to, it has to be fed. It has to be yeah. constantly refreshed. So that any viewer, any member of the public who goes to that site will find something new there. Mm -hmm. it's, it's awful to go to a site and go to some blogger and see that he hasn't posted in five days. Or, or, five, or, or five minutes. <laughs> five hours, <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, you know, the same, thing, the same thing was happening at the end of my career at ABC. I know. The last year there was a pressure, which I resisted for the most part because the demands of actually covering the Obama presidential right, right. campaign on the road were pretty daunting. But they wanted written and, if possible, video blogs right. 
submitted. And don't forget to tweet on your way back on well, the bus. Well, that wasn't going full blast <laughs> in uh, 09 yeah, or true. 08. Uh, now that's probably even more important. Yeah, but yeah. but the expectation that you're going to create video and content for a website, in addition to what you're producing for the broadcast itself, uh, is really an extraordinarily big extra load. And Mike is a facile writer, and so he's just back in the old days is probably a good in some ways. It, it takes a couple of years off of both of us, but it also is a, it's a pressure that uh, I think a lot of people feel that they outgrow along the way. Mm -hmm. One of the benefits of kind of maturing in the business is the sense that maybe you work with a little, a little less of that pressure from above that you have to produce in a, in a kind of and a you have and you have perspective that you would yeah. like to draw from. And but and I, and I was writing about websites that were created to do long-form investigative yes, journalism. Yes, that's what's so interesting. I mean, th this is not what they're about, mm -hmm. yet they feel compelled to be about it because mm -hmm. they have websites. And they have websites because they can't imagine not having websites. Right. I mean, you talked, for example, about the esteemed ProPublica. They've yeah. got, got a couple of Pulitzers under their belt. This is, this is an online service that was created expressly for the for the job of yes. doing those longer-form, harder-to-do kind of... And this would not be a problem if all of these sites had lots of people. Mm -hmm. It'd be just like the old days at the Sun Times. So you'd, you'd have a group of people doing the daily report, and another pe few people doing lo yeah. in long-term yeah. investigations. Yeah. Yeah. But nobody has enough people anymore. Well, yeah. I mean, Andy, you're you're probably feeling some of this. You jump out of one frying pan into a a bigger frying pan in a way because uh, BetterGov.org is is a is a website, but it's also becoming a kind of a center of journalism. So, are you feeling the same kind of thing? Like you've got to have this that you, every day. You got to put something new up. Well, we're able to refresh the site with a lot of content, but I ran into a personal problem there because I started with my own blog about a year ago, and we found some ways to fill it up on a regular basis. But that started becoming increasingly difficult for me personally, mm -hmm. and um, we just couldn't manage that, and so we've now merged it into a couple of other blogs. I'm busy with radio and television, managing an organization, fundraising to try to grow it, mm -hmm. going out and talking to groups. I just didn't have enough hours in the day to sit down and be a columnist, yeah, yeah. which is something I love to do. <laughs> I love to write. but. Mike talks about having had a week in the good old days and now having <laughs> to feed week. the beast. But, you know, <laughs> the concept of writing something intelligent yeah. about the subject matter you're living in yeah. on a daily basis, it, it's not that easy. It doesn't just roll right out. You've got to think it through, do some reporting, do some talking to people, and it's hard to find enough hours in the day to do that when you're doing a lot of other things. So, so yes, those demands are hard. Thankfully, we have a strong staff right now of investigators, policy people, web people, and a few thinking people, so we're able to keep the site relatively fresh. I've been the failure on the site <laughs> in terms of the <laughs> blogging because I'm the one who hasn't made the additional time. Mike has adjusted much better. He keeps his blog fresher than most, even if he won't admit that. Well, I was, I was going to say that I, I think that it is interesting to see how it, it really kind of sorts them out because you look at somebody who we all know very well, Eric Zorn is one that comes to mind and there are others, but I mean, you look at that guy posts like at three o'clock in the morning and then reposts at yeah. seven. He, he's posting 24 hours a day, seven days a week and cranking out a column. And I just don't really understand. How he the, does it. Well, yeah, I mean, what the, what the requirements are. But you know, when I finished reading your piece in The Reader, which I very strongly recommend to anybody who's interested in media, um, it occurred to me that you would you could probably sit a bunch of people around the table in like about 1980 uh, when cable TV was coming online and you'd get the same thing because here's here's you know television news is on a 24-hour cycle you have plenty of you're gonna do one newscast every day and all of a sudden CNN comes in changes everything and then you you have a 24-hour cycle and you gotta feed this beast every second of the day and of course, they solved it by bringing in bloviators, which is something that maybe is a luxury that, well, I don't know, maybe bloggers yeah, are bloviators. They brought in bloviators, and there's also an enormous amount of repetition. Yeah, these yeah. They don't expect, it's sort of like um, uh, WBBM uh, radio. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They don't expect anybody to watch it or listen to it for very long. Yeah, yeah. They just expect lots and lots of people to listen for a short period of time. That's 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 actually a really good point. I mean, whether it's Fox or MSNBC or even CNN, 
I mean, the same ideas, the same react to the same political and world news plays incessantly. Mm -hmm. And so you can pretty much get your fill of it in a very short time, right. just as you can right. from BBM Radio. But the, but the other side of it, which is the thing that I think you guys are talking about, and I think you're beginning to see in this kind of online world, is the need to just simply create news out of, out of thin air. air. Yeah. I mean, it's sort of like, well, this really isn't a story, but by God, we got nothing else. We're going to talk about it for two hours. Well, bloggers, many bloggers do the same thing. It's like, I don't know if this is really a big story, but I'm going to write about this. And then the mirrors, the echo chamber take effect, and the next thing you know, everybody's talking about this. You know, we're slowly p tearing the wings off a lot of flies. Um, <laughs> because we've got nothing else to do. <laughs> because there's nothing left to do. <laughs> well, one of the things that, that I, I know we've we've all lamented in all of news media is the fact that uh, fewer and fewer people are being paid to create content mm -hmm. uh, and and yet at the same time the need to create even more content and I think that was a, I, I, I expect that might have been a factor in this kind of celebrated little again one of these things created by blogs and echoed all over the place but uh, with, apo with apologies to our colleagues at Channel 2, uh, they got caught in the ringer uh, a week or two ago when uh, one of the journalism schools uh, kind of exposed this thing. But let's start off, if we could, by just watching this clip of something that was aired on Channel 2. They've since taken it off their website, but it lives online. Uh, this is something that Channel 2 aired early in the morning, I think it was like a 6 o'clock newscast, uh, about a shooting that had happened on the south side of Chicago. Let's just watch that clip. And kids on the street, as young as four, were there to see it all unfold and had a disturbing reaction. No, I'm not scared of nothing. When What's you get older, you going to stay away from all these guns? No. No? No. What do you want to do when you get older? I'm going to have me a gun. You because I live right here and I don't want none of my family members to get shot. Right. That is very scary indeed. So far, no suspects are in custody. So there you have it, a, a pretty ordinary looking package, complete with the tut tutting anchor at the desk saying how awful this is mm -hmm. that society is going to hell in a handbasket. And then somehow or other, and I, I don't even know the details and it's not worth wasting the time on it, but somehow or other we find out that that's not exactly what happened. There, um, someone was able to obtain the camera roll, the actual tape, the unedited tape, or at least some section of the unedited tape, and we see that maybe it wasn't exactly that way. Let's watch the second clip. This is, this is the raw tape, or at least a portion of the, real the raw tape. Well, that's what I like to hear. You ain't scared of nothing. Damn. When you get older, you're going to stay away from all these guns? No. No? No. What do you want to do when you get older? Me you are? Why do you want to do that? Good. You know what happens when I'm going to be the police. Okay, well then, then you can have one. Now, I want to say before we go any further, we are all people who've spent a lot of time in editing booths and at typewriters and everything else. And I, I will speak for myself, not for these two esteemed gentlemen, but I bet all three of us have made mistakes and this was an editing mistake. And, you know, so you, you, you don't want to make too big a deal out of this, but this is a this is a serious problem. I mean, this is this is a this is not a good thing. Well, look, I spent 33 years in the TV news business, and I probably spent a thousand hours in editing rooms, and I don't think I've ever made that particular mistake. I've made lots of others, but I will say, in all honesty, that there's a cardinal rule of newsrooms, and this is this applies to print, radio television and now online and that is you don't drastically alter the meaning of what someone says for the sake of a sound bite we all live for sound bites and that young man's bite you could question whether you should ever put a four-year-old on the news to begin with there's without that. parental consent but there's a news story going down and I think we've all done that but I think that the sin here uh, is that it, had you played the entire little clip there to the end where he says he's going to be the police then at least it's in context, and it's, it begins a little bit frighteningly and ends maybe almost endearingly mm -hmm. because he's siding with the good guys, as right. it were. I think the real mistake there is you make him look like at four, ready to become a, a gangbanger, yeah, when in effect he's reacting to his environment perhaps in a healthy way. Yeah, and yeah. I think that's why a head probably should have rolled there because that, that is pretty sinful, and that, that's something that you really can't do. 
Yes, we take short bites. Yes, we may not explain the whole meaning of what someone said. But when you have something that means something totally different than what was actually said, I think then you've truly subverted your responsibility. I, I think the big mistake was to use it at all. I mean, the, he was being, I think, sort of goaded by the interviewer to say stuff. Um, when, he, when he said, I'm going to get me a gun, uh, he wasn't cut off. There was no sense that he was about to say, because I want to be a policeman. Uh, he stopped. Then the, uh, the interviewer came back with another question. He had, a, he had time to think it over. And he added this. Um, and I, I, I'm not sure it was one connected thought. Mm -hmm. It was sort of r random mm -hmm. language, as you tend to get from a four-year-old who didn't belong in the air. So as, as these kind of <laughs> senior statesmen of the industry sitting around the table pontificating here, is this, um, is there something significant to this? Is, is this like the beginning of the end of communications as we know it, or is it just a no, random I, I think I think the one thing that's, that's uh, instructive here is that in the early days of our television uh, world, um, we went out and got our own stories and our own interviews and had there you go. had kind of an unwritten set of rules. I mean, look, this isn't the medical profession or the legal profession. There, there's not uh, a code and there's not a board that kind of watches you. But there's accepted rules of, of behavior and, and newscasting. And the question of what you do with underaged individuals was always something that you had to deal with carefully. Um, Any time I interviewed anyone under the age of consent, it was with the approval of the parent or if it was in a school, the approval of the teacher or the principal. So you never just grabbed a child for interview purposes. But in the last decade or more, TV newsrooms have relied on a lot of what we mm -hmm. call stringers. Yeah, and, which is and people, that's, that's what we're yeah, seeing here. They, right? they roam the streets at night, and it's a great profession if you want to do that. They follow the police and fire radios. They go where the action is. They get the video, and then they sell it to the stations. Mm -hmm. In one night, one particular person can sell a story to six or seven television stations at 150 bucks a pop, and you can make $1,000. And if you're on to three stories in one night, that's three grand overnight. The problem is that these same people who are taking the pictures are also asking the questions right. As in we an unfiltered there. environment, and they don't tend to be anyone with real journalism backgrounds. They're technicians. They know how to operate cameras. Most of them are wonderful people, but they're not operating under any kind of code of conduct even if it's not written. And I think that's where you get into lots of problems. In this case, though, as I understand it, uh, the decision to cut the last line or two was made in the studio by, by an editor at 5 in the morning, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, whoever, you know, gets mm -hmm. is so good at his job or her job that they're assigned to the 5 a.m. show. <laughs> uh, probably somebody had been working there two weeks. And it, it was a story about a shooting in which nobody was even particularly injured. Uh, no, no right, one, right. Nobody was right. killed, nobody was critically that's, injured. That's another it wasn't a story point. to begin with. Right, right. It was just the, sh the shock value of having this little kid say, I want to get a gun when I grow up. And, and that actually brings me to another issue that, that I, again, I don't know if my perception is correct about this, but it seems to me that since the new administration and McCarthy coming in as police chief, uh, that at least in print and more online of the newspaper sites, we're seeing the daily drumbeat of how many people have been killed and lots more details about who was killed and when and all that. Am I, am I imagining that? Because it sure seems to me that we're, uh, we used to have the, you know, well, seven people were killed this weekend. And then, of course, the Sun Times won the Pulitzer by going back and looking at the fact that none of those cases had been solved. Um, but now we seem to have this, it seems to me anyway, this, this, this kind of like uh, a drum roll every, every day. There's, uh, here's, who, here's who was killed and who was shot overnight. I think these things go in waves. A few yeah. years ago, the Tribune, for a year, did an article on every juvenile murder um, mm -hmm. and, and were praised for that. Uh, when murders are closely looked at, I think, the groups uh, among whom the, the mur these murders occur tend to complain. Mm -hmm. They think they're being um, caricatured. Right, right. When they're ignored, the same groups complain because they think they're being ignored. They think there's crime in our neighborhood and the and media no downtown isn't paying any attention to yeah, it. Whereas yeah. if it happens in Lincoln Park, they would. 
I, I, I've also found that it, it's been interesting to me with the rise of some of the, for what, I don't know how else to describe them, but alternate media, like the, the, um, the reporter, for yeah. example. Uh, th there have been a lot of you know, professional organizations who have really been going back and looking at this. Here's where the crime's happening. Here's what, right. in ways that, as you say, it comes in waves, but, but we're, we're seeing a lot more of that right now. And I'm just kind of wondering if the newsrooms and the editors aren't being a little bit more sensitive to this and trying to, for better or worse, they're just thinking we can't ignore this right now. Or maybe it's a way of, you know, sort of like lighting a fire under the new mayor, the new, new police commissioners. Like, have you noticed all this going on? I don't know. I think Mike's right, though. I think I remember over the years, it's cyclical. There are times when you decide that you're spending too much time on crime and you should, de you should do that a little less. There'll be, co there'll, there'll be complaints that you tend to show pictures of one group uh, predominantly because maybe there's a higher crime rate among mm -hmm. that group and then you're accused of basically stereotyping and stigmatizing that group and so yeah, maybe you'll yeah. back off for a little bit. But at the end of the day, the sad thing, at least for television, is that those sorts of things are, are grist for the mill. Uh, there's something compelling about the, the, the flashing police lights right, that's the and, old and the tape <laughs> the and, age the, old and, the, thing. and the sirens and the fire trucks and the hoses and the, and the, and the crunched up car in the accident <laughs> and the pool of blood that you may show one day and not the next. Uh, Those sorts of things are what a picture medium is really about. Right, right. And of course, I think every, every newspaper and magazine has become as visually oriented as they're able to be right. with their pictures. Right, and, right. And of course, the, was it the Mirror of London with the fourth page, which is a nude in it, uh, which we still don't have here in the <laughs> States, but maybe, maybe we will sooner or later. Who and, knows? And, and this was a 5.30 or whatever it was, AM newscast. What are you going to have on a newscast like that, right. except the overnight crime? Right, right, right. So we've got about a minute left, and, and I just want to get your takes. This, this last week, we, or a couple of weeks, we've seen this, this <coughs> little brouhaha breaking out between Emmanuel and the governor over uh, casinos in Chicago. And you guys have both observed this stuff for so long. Should we have a casino in Chicago? Should, we, should, should, he, should he be pushing the governor to, to, to support this legislation? I think in the best of all possible worlds, or the second best of all possible worlds, no. Mm -hmm. We live in probably the 40, 43rd <laughs> of best of all possible. So in the 43rd and, possible. And, and maybe it's necessary. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it should be closely monitored, and I think, I think Quinn has some good points to make. You must have something to say about <laughs> this, Mr. Shaw. Wrote a long letter to the editor of the Tribune about a week ago saying we're not opposed to gaming, we're not opposed to a casino in Chicago, we being the Better Government Association, but too many questions still haven't been answered about economic impact, dislocation of, e of economic activity from other venues, uh, the crime issue, the mob issue, the location issue. And so what we advise the governor to do is to appoint a task force and try to answer the basic questions before you go forward on this mammoth expansion to Pat Quinn's credit, whether he is we're doing have to Oh, okay. We're gonna At have least to. Quinn is taking his time and studying it, and that's a good thing. Rahm is in a bit too much of a hurry. All right. Well, we want to thank both of these guys for being on the show here today, of course, Mike Miner and Andy Shaw. And uh, we want to thank you for watching. You've been watching Chicago Newsroom here on Can TV, where it's a community service. And, of course, you can find us here on cable. You can see this and many other programs on cantv.blip.tv. Check us out there. Subscribe on iTunes and lots of other things. And we are running late. We'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. I'm Ken Davis. See you next time.